much people are using the Slack service that we have, but I would encourage you to do so. In the past, some very important questions have been posted. Recently, Natalia posted an absolutely central issue to which I gave a reply in the Heidi Ryan Classical Thought channel. But we think it's so important that Aaron and I would like to open a discussion about it further. And for that reason, I've prepared a, an extended introduction to, to today's session. What Natalia asks about is central to the sections that we are studying of Einführung in die Metaphysik, the introduction to metaphysics um, uh, at the moment. Let us begin with a very important observation taken from today's text. Heidegger says on page Nehemiah 60, dass wir anführen, nie den ganzen Tatbestand in seiner Tragweite wird deutlich, that we never advance the whole state of, ma of the matters clarified in its entire scope. He means that in trying to explain something in relation to being, it's impossible to exhaust completely everything that could be said. There is always more. Some philosophers dislike what for them is a lack of ability to clarify or define or exhaust the possibilities of a matter, to pin it down, as it were. They say things like, for the purposes of today's argument, we are going to take X to mean Y. But then X leaks, which is what a declaration of this form attests to. It says more than merely the clarification or limitation Y suffices to say. X says itself maximally, it cannot be held in. And above all, therefore, being itself cannot be exhausted in its contents, because being alone has the breadth to carry us entire. This is a thought that would have been entirely satisfactory even to the thinkers of the Middle Ages. As one of the universals, every attempt to analyse being will fall short of its universal reach. Let us therefore recall that in the questioning we undertake, in pursuing, in going after, nach, Heidegger says, what is to be thought, nach das zu denkende, each of the ways in which we think being must of necessity imply all the others. There are so many terms for being. Even if what they, in their particularity, this term here emphasizes, falls into the background, for what this other term that we're focusing on today, this particular direction of questioning with this term, brings to the fore. Now, Natalia asks about the question of presence in Heidegger's understanding. Presence is a way of thinking being. Heidegger says this repeatedly and often and in numerous places. Natalia cites two authors in particular who raise questions for her with regard to how Heidegger leads us into the question of presence. One is Husserl, where, and she raises two texts that Husserl uh, wrote, and the other is Wittgenstein. That Heidegger may be entirely familiar with the formulations of Husserl is suggested by the fact that one of the texts that Natalia mentions, the Lectures on the Phenomenology of Internal Time Consciousness, was edited for publication in 1928 by one Martin Heidegger. Natalia raises three modes of presence as understood by Husserl, and she lists these as presence as one, the represented, two, keeping presence in retention, and three, presence as itself, what Husserl also calls primal impression. This word primal or primary, primaire in, in German, is a word frequently used by Husserl in a multitude of places. Now the problem raised here as a formulation is very old. We may say that what represents itself is what Aristotle in, in the De Anima calls Phantasia, which came into German as Einbildungskraft, a word that assumes a huge significance in Kant's third critique, the so-called critique of judgment. It's actually the critique of Einbildungskraft. But it appears in Latin, especially in Descartes' Meditations and in his Principia, as a passive infinitive, imaginari, to be imagining. Einbildungskraft means the power to form images, imaginari, to be imagining. 
It's often translated as a deponent verb, which means a passive construction that really has an active meaning. But this is a sleight of hand. The passive infinitive captures something important, that what comes back in the images of memory, what is remembered, has about it a certain independence. We don't always, and often we don't at all, have control over the images that flash into our mind. Memory comes back to us as a to-be imagining. The images stand there for themselves and represent themselves to us. Nor do these images come back to order. We find ourselves saying it comes back for itself or we find it fails to. Thus we say with regard to this kind of presence, as I remember it, or I can't quite remember it, or I'm not sure I'm remembering it correctly, or I don't remember that at all. And then we say, I remember it as if it were yesterday. What is remembered is in each case, or not remembered, and no longer present. That that comes back in a mode of presence, the not presently present, but is still a presence, a presence. Moreover, a presence in some sense for itself. That's not how I remember it, we hear ourselves saying. And then the masterful statement by our recently de deceased Queen Elizabeth II, recollections may vary. A court of law is a public attempt to fix the no longer present of the represented. In Greek, memory or presence of this form is said as mimnisko, mimnesis, to remember, remembrance as such. This reduplicative, uh, reduplicative form, mimni, mimno, mnimno, literally, specifically points to the past and means more literally to let what was be again in some way. Now, second in Husserl's list, as Natalia offers it, is keeping presence in retention. We think here of learning, of holding before ourselves what may not remain immediately present, but retains presence for me. We learn verb tables like this or other similar matters, sometimes by putting something in front of ourselves and then taking it away again. We make it present to ourselves, try to remember it, and then we take it away to fix upon it. We actually remove it to fix upon it more. The Greek verb here is naomai, which has the meaning to fix upon. We, we might say to focus upon, to hold present, even when not present. We can perform this making present when not present in learning, but there are many other ways that, uh, that this um, naomai can be done. Now, these first two that Natalia raises deal with presence that is no longer or not always present or even that it's not present enough, or either absolutely or in some particular way. To show how this is, when we fix upon something in learning, we continually bring it before us, we let it present, and then take it away in order to fix upon it, as I've already said. But when something wonderful happens to us, we say to ourselves, I wish this would last forever. We cannot fix upon it enough. And when the opposite, something dreadful happens, it fixes upon us, even though we would earnestly wish it away. I wish my friend were not so ill. Afterwards, we try to forget dreadful things, and yet they stay fixed. We say, I can't get this out of my mind. Now, why do I mention these verbs, mimnisko, mnaomai? In both cases, the root, the reduplicated root, mnimno, mna, mna. The root is men, the men of the old Eolic infinitive of the Greek verb to be, in Attic, enai. But Parmenides says being as emenai, en men I. The word men means stand, stood, standing up. What is brought to stand forth and stand out again, nim men, i.e. men men. What is being made to stand, men aomai. The Greek terms disclose that each is a mode of being, a mode of presence. Heidegger emphasizes this notion of standing as how being is. 
in the Einführung in die Metaphysik Lectures yeah, that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, the introduction to metaphysics. Now, the third of Husserl's determinations listed by Natalia is presence as itself. Husserl calls this the Urquelle for alles weitere Bewusstsein und Sein, the originary source for all consciousness, Bewusstsein, and being, Sein. What presently presents itself to us, addresses us, we might even say. The way Husserl puts it at times, we could even say the presently present assaults us, it befalls us, it comes at us. He even at times calls this ereignis. It creates what he calls an ur-impression, an originary impression, something that really hits us. Husserl's emphasis on the ur, the originary, and the primär, the primary character of the third mode of presence that Natalia names, indicates that this third mode, as the originary source of being and what he calls consciousness, has priority over the other two. And we will come back to this shortly, but I will ask you to hold it in mind. Here is where we can also bring in Wittgenstein, whom Natalia, Natalia also refers to in her question. Why should present presence have priority over that kind of presence which is past or gone? First, before we discuss Wittgenstein, let's clarify a little bit by what we mean by presence. Strictly speaking in German, the question of presence is raised by the term das Anwesende, presence as a whole, but also as ein Anwesendes, a thing here present. We add to this the verb Anwesen, often used by Heidegger, presencing, and das Anwesen, presencing as such and in itself that there is presencing. Now Husserl does not use deriv derivations of Anwesen to name presence in the same way that Heidegger does, but he focuses on these two other words, being, sein, and consciousness, Bewusstsein. Let us keep in mind that presence, presencing, being, and consciousness, at least for Husserl, all therefore belong together. Wittgenstein, reporting in lectures that he gave in Cambridge in the 1930s, this is the passage that Natalia draws my attention to, speaks not of any of these terms, but of experience, he says. Specifically, he calls it present experience. Now, we can safely say that Bewusstsein, being aware, mindful, mindful being, is the same as what Wittgenstein says both he and Bertrand Russell, he names Russell in this part of the text, call present experience. What is indicated here is the formula of Bishop Berkeley, per chippy, esse est per chippy, something that Heidegger raised repeatedly. He was troubled by this formulation. He discusses it in several places. Being is, for Bishop Berkeley, being perceived. Now, this percipi is again a passive infinitive. You have no choice over the perceptions that come to you, that before you. Percipere is to take in. It can even mean to eat in Latin. Percipi is to be taking in what comes to you, even to, to take into the box, as it were, to take into the head or consciousness. Capax, captus, per captus, being mindful, bewusstsein. This is the province in which we're moving. Das Sein, as Husserl speaks of it here, das Anwesende, as Heidegger will call it, are in this sense both descriptions of presence, the most primary kind of presence, namely the presently present. Wittgenstein says this when he says present experience. Now, if we return to Husserl's list, we can see each is a mode of presence, the was present, the being kept in presence, and the presently present. Now, why does the presently present lead? Again, for this, we can turn to Wittgenstein, who explains it more easily and more cogently than Husserl does, for two reasons. First, Wittgenstein says, and I quote, the person who says only the present is real because past and future are not here, has before his mind the image of something moving. 
So we have to ask Wittgenstein, what is it that moves? Wittgenstein provides in the text a diagram in the published uh, version of the lectures, which he presu I presume he drew on the board at the time. He draws up past, present, future, but he underscored these three with an arrow pointing backwards from right to left, demonstrating that the order of movement is from the future into the present, thence off into the past. Heidegger said something very similar about the structure of what arrives for us in a lecture of 1924. Husserl agrees. He speaks both in the lectures on the uh, internal time consciousness and then in the Berlau manuscripts, the second of the text, Natalia cites, of what he calls the flow of time, Fluss. But even more, Husserl describes it like this. He says, and I translate, every new prime, ever new primal impressions, in Urp impressionen, continually flash forth with ever new matter, now the same, now changing. Thus the primacy of the third mode of presence is because it is a source of externality. We might call this objectivity or out thereness, which is brought in here, per chipitur, it is perceived. We see therefore that for Husserl and for Wittgenstein, there is a fundamental connection between presence and time and perception. In a way, presence discloses the flow of time, the fluss, lets it be seen. But, but more important even than that, the immediate, the presently present, the this here present, allows us to set the other presence, those coming at us, those flowing off into uh, off and away, into their proper order. The flow of time is made up in what way and of what, we might ask. What does it consist of? Husserl says nows. Each present presence is a now. And he adds, and I translate again, primal impression or impression has as its content that which the word now signifies insofar as it is taken in the strictest sense. The primal now, the presently present now, fixes us, nama again, but at this time, we're the ones being fixed. Hence its power to be the primary of the three. It takes and assumes being. It stands forth, emanates, if you like, for a false friend etymology. It sticks out and comes to be present as what is before it passes away. Can we then ask, is every now a being in some way? Well, perhaps, perhaps that's where we'll end up, but there's more to come first. Moreover, this description of Husserl's would seem to be confirmed by Wittgenstein, but as he proceeds, Wittgenstein identifies a problem. He says, even while he talks about an external world, there that, that going, that over there coming in towards us, granting the inside to perception, a taking in. And, this, and then he makes an aside in his lecture, and I read it. He says, when in philosophy we talk of the present, we seem to be referring to a sort of Euclidean point. When we talk of present experience, it is impossible to identify the present with such a point. The difficulty is with the word present. Now, let me say that what presents itself to Wittgenstein here is precisely what Heidegger seeks to explain. We can point to a point or point it up, even theoretically, it's what Euclid does. It constitutes a position on a line, the line that time is, the arrow that Wittgenstein draws. But a now cannot really be thought like a point on a line. We'll come back to this in a moment, but what first we need to ask, what word functions as presence for Heidegger? I've already talked about das Anwesen or um, das Anwesende, but here, of course, I'm back on a certain kind of hobby horse that many of you will be familiar with. The real word for presence in Heidegger's work par excellence is das Seiende, or sometimes he speaks of ein Seiendes, which, as I have insisted, ad nauseum cannot and really must not be translated as beings. Das Seiende is a singular. Ein Seiende is a singular. 
when we call these beings, we mistranslate, at least in terms of the number. Das Zayanda indicates an abstract unity, not a heap or an aggregate. If there is a heap, it is what lets the heap be seen as a whole, as a heap, not, and indeed precisely not, what constitutes the individuated parts of the heap or the units of the aggregate. So in other words, Das Zayanda names the unity of what we see, even though it this unity is simultaneously naming a multitude. Now, ein sein des, which is a slightly different word from das sein der, however, surely does indicate a single something, ein, a, being, sein des. Again, perhaps, but not as neatly as we might think. What does the word ein sein des really say? I have noted before that although it is in the nominative case, ein sein des, nominative, there is a view that its es ending indicates what was originally an old partitive genitive. I am not an expert in linguistics, and so I cannot with any authority comment on the veracity of this view, but what is said here may very well help us to see what is at issue. What is a partitive genitive? It is an abstract noun that denotes a present or actual example of an abstract totality by holding before us the totality in question, even when we are thinking of the specificity. An example given of a partitive genitive is so-and-so is a person of importance. Now within the importantly important, the person specified is part of that importance. This person here is important with respect to importance in general. David Schur and I had a long conversation about this. Both the specificity and the, you know, I'm very grateful to David, we, we talked through the different aspects of this as we understood it. Both the specificity and the universality are held together in the partitive genitive. Ein sein des, thought in a way as a partitive genitive, says literally an of being, where what is actively being, all the presently present, is the whole unity. And this, which we are saying it is specifically this thing that we are saying is part of that presently present, and is therefore specifically with respect to of being. But isn't das sein the totality? Isn't that how normally Heideggerian scholars normally explain this? Isn't das sein the totality? And so this being here, and therefore the partitive bit of being, ein sein des. Haven't we got that wrong? So das sein the totality and ein sein des the, the singularity. The answer must be no, and understanding that no, or not paying sufficient attention to it, is what I might respectfully suggest has led to a great deal of confusion in the interpretation of Heidegger almost from the beginning, a confusion that Heidegger was well aware of and commented on. In fact, it frustrated him. The abstract totality of Zion Des is not absolutely different from the abstract totality of Das Zion. They're related. They're not the same, but they're related. Refer you back to that thinking of how we can focus on one aspect of how being speaks and then on another. They belong together. We can, in a dependent sense, speak of a being and mean a thing. But even in today's reading, Heidegger reminds us this isn't really the ordinary way that we speak. We speak of individual beings only in a very dependent sense. You can catch a glimpse, therefore, from this of why Heidegger was so interested in not beings, but things, the thing. Die Frage nach dem Ding, he says, die Sache, die Sache selbst, the question of the thing. We can speak of being, we can speak of beings, and on very rare occasions Heidegger does, but they are so rare that they stand out. And when he does speak of beings, die Zeyenden, 
he is making a point often about how odd that speech is. Every din is, yes, ein Zayandes, but not every Zayandes, jener Zayandes, each Zayandes, is a thing, as we shall shortly see. Conversely, every time we speak of a being, every time we speak of a being, we can at the same time speak without the article. A pen is a being. A pen is being. I am a being. I am being, and so forth. We can simply drop the article. The number in every statement of being, zayend, is dependent and secondary. Zayend, zayende, zayendes, these are all words Heidegger uses in this text, names a kind of happening namely presencing of what is present more and more properly than it names things, beings. Now, when we name a thing as a being, we have a tendency to strip its happening off it, to identify it through and within the subject-object distinction. This is what Heidegger is really concerned about. A being, a thing, becomes an object, ein Gegenstand in German, within the objective world, die Gegenständlichkeit, objectivity, if you like. So when does Heidegger speak of ein sein des? Most importantly, as I showed with an example in the reading group last year, when that naming of being, sei end, has a time. This pen is being now. I was being then, last year. To give it its full explanation, ein sein des denotes presence during or at time. Hence my example of the nicht mehr sein des of the afternoon in the classroom. Heidegger uses the term nicht mehr sein des in several places, but let's focus again on his use of it in the Hegel lectures of 1930 that I have quoted a year ago. Let's bring that back. Mnam a mimnesis, a remembrance. So let me rehearse the example for you once again. In some lectures on Hegel given just three years after the publication of Sein und Zeit, Heidegger addresses the character of the now as what is given in presentness, presence. In these lectures he says, and I quote, now is afternoon. This is an incontestable truth. We preserve this truth by fixing it in chalk on the blackboard. When early tomorrow morning at eight o'clock the janitor comes to the lecture hall to see if everything is in order, if the blackboard is clean, and he reads the sentence, now is afternoon, then he will not admit at any price that the sentence could be true. The sentence overnight has become false. That being, Zeyende in the German of this text, which the now was, is already a no more being. Heidegger says, ein nicht mehr sein des. Again, that which was some point long ago, a specified being, sein der, i.e. ein sein des, is now a no more being, ein nicht mehr sein des. There are other places, by the way, where he uses this term, nicht mehr sein des. The now and the being it shows, the specified afternoon, is both an ion, a unity of time, and a being. What was present at that time, everything that was present at that time, and now. Ein sein des is, most fully understood, a time in which some being, sein der, was occurring, going on, overall. Some overall now that happened. You should hear in this, Manamai, Mimnesis. Those one, two, three of Natalia's quotation from Husserl. Have we just, though, not simply repeated Wittgenstein's arrow? Well, not quite, but there's some small way to go to see that, although we're nearly there. The genuine partitive genitive presupposes that the partitive aspect slices up time in some particular way. 
And in naming the totality and keeping it in view includes within it the presence of what is or was or will be simultaneously with the totality. Now, isn't that what nows do? And here is where we address Wittgenstein's difficulty head on. It was not Arist uh, Husserl, but Aristotle, who said that time is comprised of a flow of nows. He calls each now tonun, the now. Heidegger lays Aristotle's understanding out in a multiplicity of places, and in each case he rejects it. So why? He calls it the vulgar um, uh, understanding of time, the common understanding of time. Vulgar here doesn't mean, uh, it just means the usual understanding of time. It would seem that the now as a discrete unit of time is therefore always the same in length. As such, as Aristotle, as Aristotle says, it is countable in the soul. Now, this is an important point. Aristotle says you can only really count things that are the same. In other words, you can't count two apples and two pears as four things. The, the, the number and what things are the number of matters to Aristotle. So therefore, we do presume that Aristotle assumes that every now is the same and we can count them in the soul. This is why it may seem to have, the now may seem to have the character of a Euclidean point. A line, the line of time, can be bisected at any point, the now point. Exactly as Wittgenstein asks, we cannot identify that point. It's the other way about. The point is not put there. It's not a thesis as a bisection. It simply is there. It seems each time there's a now. And if we follow Husserl, we assemble the line out of it. This isn't very Euclid Euclidean, and Wittgenstein knows that. It's the other way around. And then we cannot trap and encapsulate a now and keep it here. We can't pin it down. It flows off. It's gone already before we've taken it in. Well, isn't that just how nows are, you might say? You can know them, but you cannot have them. You can't put them in a box. Non percipi, non percipi, as it were, they can't be captured, non captors. Here, therefore, I stress, we must turn everything upside down. What Husserl and Wittgenstein both assume, in complete conformity with Aristotle, is that time itself, the flow, the fluss, throws beings at us, like, as it were, in the example I would give, is balls out of an automated tennis machine on a practice court. You've seen these things. They just keep coming. The person who's on the court has to keep batting them away. It's exactly what Husserl was talking about earlier in his example of all these, all these um, experiences flashing at us. The now is a given externality that we take in per chippy and then in some magical sense lose. It goes off. The continuity and ineluctability of the discrete nows is also their objectivity. So let's ask a difficult question. Just how long is a now? Now there will be those saying, well, this one never shuts up. Now is going on forever. This now is lasting an awfully long time. There is no independent measure of a now, I would suggest to you. Time is not made up of discrete units. But every genuine Zyander presence for a time is also a unity. It's a one, one being, ein Zyanderes. So here it is necessary to say just a little bit about why this word Zyand, Zyander, and Das Zyander assume such importance for Heidegger. What does this word allow him to bring before us? Well, first let us emphasize it's not his word. Too little attention has been given by contemporary scholars to the extent to which Heidegger is almost always using terms developed in German thought since, well, probably with Lessing, but certainly with Kant, philosophy began to be done in German, Germany in German, in the German language. Even today, this is little more than 250 years. It's not long. Das Seiende is used by everyone from Adorno to Edvard Zeller, with Kant in between. In one sense, das Seiende, ein Seiendes, names what is. We might dare to say the objectively present. 
This is why Heidegger emphasizes it as a totality, das Seinde im Ganzen, all the being that is occurring here in the present. More simply put, the present of presence, or that there is presence. Moreover, what he names with das Seinde is what appears for itself, Feinestai in Greek. Medial, it appears for itself. I don't make it appear, it just is in its appearing. It simply is. Es gibt das Seinde. It's what's here, it's what's there, da. But objectivity in German presupposes the gegen, against and over which, of gegenständlich, the objective. Over against what or whom? The subjectivity of the subject. Once again, we encounter the subject-object distinction and we encounter Wittgenstein's external world. I'm in here, the subject, and there's the world out there. But there is no external world for Heidegger. He abandons the subject-object distinction. He's the most implacable en 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 uh, enemy of the subjectivity of the subject. There is for Heidegger just world because there is no in here behind my eyeballs or inside my head. I don't go in and out through my senses for sense impressions. I am within what is. If you can take one thing to heart from everything I've said, it's that little sentence. I am within what is. This means there never is a gegen, an over against. Everything is always a kind of already within. All genuine present being is a kind of within itself. Now, a within itself is what Parmenides had called suniches, held together within itself, sun with echein, to hold, to have. A suniches within the totality of the held together within itself, being itself, Parmenides says, is a suniches. Presence isn't a point, a Euclidean point, because it's always a totality and a unity at the same time. The presently present, das Seiende, is also what da ist. It's all just here. And so is da sein, the present, namely the presently present. And if you've understood this, now you can hear properly that formula of Heidegger's that Dasein, here being, presently being, is that Zayendes, being, happening, unfolding, occurring, that is a concern for myself. That's why Dasein is in some sense mine. It is in each sense mine. It is je meinig. My being is taken off from the totality of present being, namely all the being that's going on here, and you are as much in that being as I am. It is in this way that I am da sein. Even when on the very rare occasions Heidegger refers to ein da sein, and he does, but it's very rare, he means a present being as presence in a world, and he means all that together a present being as a presence in a world, all at once. That's what Dasein means. That's why I've found myself saying over the years to, to many students, there's no such thing as Mr. or Ms. Dasein. So can we speak of beings, Dasein den? There's the real plural. This is another way of saying, are there nows? Is there a multiplicity of nows? So now, since we've done our homework in a funny sort of way, I'm going to say yes, but let me explain. I asked, how long is a noun? To which I replied, there is, and never can be, a standard noun. Each noun is a present presence, ein Zeyendes. The afternoon in the classroom was ein Zeyendes, but it wasn't a thing, even less an object. What is the most important of the beings that I know? Most important among all the Zayenden beings is that being, Zayend, that I am, a within which, that constant presence that I am to myself. Heraclitus says, 
ta me do non pote. You remember, we spent months on this little phrase. The that which never sinks away. My duration as Zayendes and as Ein Zayendes is given by my being Thnitos, Sum Tuda, the from which my unity is taken off. I don't know my totality, in other words. Homer says it's only when our knees are loosened that our being is complete. But we do know that we are a unity because we are finite. We are off towards death. It will come to us in the end. So here we can eradicate the Euclidean point from presence by showing that what presence is, presence is within being as a whole, but not through a measured now, a specified unit, but with respect to each thing's own unity and entirety. So we can speak of Zayenden in the following way, the Industrial Revolution, the Qing Dynasty, a flash in the pan, each is Zion, being. Each presence is. Presence is for itself, finest thy. Each has a, its own, proper time. Every being is its time of being, even when that time of being has to be derived from being from and being towards. We say this is an in-between, Zwischenfall, Heidegger calls it, the Zwischenfall of being mortal, Sein zum Tode. Nitos. So let me make one final point before I let this now finally come to an end. At the end of section 29 of uh, the Einführung in die Metaphysik lectures, this is page Nehemiah 64, Heidegger says, zu jeder Zeit war und ist und wird der Mensch sein, weil Zeit sich nur zeitigt, sofern der Mensch ist. And we could translate this as, at each time, there was and is and will be humanity, man, because time temporalizes itself, temporalizes itself only as long as there is man. If time is not now as counted in the soul, how is it that time temporalizes itself? Does time count man, Zyander, instead of souls counting nows? That's a really important question. Is it the other way around from how Aristotle posed it? In his Parmenides lectures of 1942 and 43, Heidegger says, and I quote, time in sein und Zeit, no matter how strange this may sound, is the given name of the originary ground of the word. Now, what does this extraordinary sentence say? Time as the bringing of man to his proper word, what he says, is the letting of what is present, presence, and so is presencing itself. Just as Heidegger changes the character of the objectivity of being, he transforms Aristotle's incipient subjectivity of time, that it's all in the soul. Is it not, therefore, that the timing of time is how man is unfolded in and as the presence that he or she is. Namely, that he lets what is presence. And this is what we also call being. Here we would recall Zeno's claim that was mocked by Plato and Aristotle alike, that there is no change in being. There is only change in time. We should say, the timing of time is motion, kinesis, change as such. Now there's still far more to be said, but this, now he's still talking, must come to an end at some point and be a nicht mehr Thank you all very much. <laughs>